Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Humanities at Home with uh, Humanities Nebraska. And really glad you could join us. I'm Chris Sumrick, Executive Director of Humanities Nebraska. And I'm going to be keeping an eye on Facebook as we do this and make sure that we have folks joining us. Um, it's really uh, just amazing day in Nebraska to wake up with white a uh, white blanket of snow and then have it be sunny and green grass by the end of the day. So I hope you all manage to uh, get out and enjoy this late evening weather and really glad that you uh, are, have sat down with us to go through uh, to having a humanities experience. So again, Chris Sumrick, I'm Executive Director of Humanities Nebraska. And we are a statewide nonprofit organization whose mission is to kind of help Nebraskans explore what connects us and makes us human. And normally, uh, connecting us means coming together and doing that in person. And so this spring has been quite a challenge for all of us, of course. And for us as an organization, it's been um, trying to continue our mission at a time when we all can't be together in person. So uh, one way that we're trying to do that is through these Humanities at Home uh, events and programs. And so this is the second uh, edition of that. We had uh, Andy Jewell last week on uh, Humanities at Home uh, in a conversation about Willa Cather. So that was a lot of fun. And we have a really special treat for you tonight as well. And I wanna just share a little background on this one is originally uh, tonight's program was gonna be uh, a an event at Joslin Castle in Omaha. And we're gonna be bringing together um, our board members from around the state because we have a statewide board and we have a board meeting tomorrow, uh, which is now of course by video conference. Uh, and we also have it as our patron circle event the night before with our board. And so uh, we love bringing together our board members and our donors. And um, this program was gonna be at Joslin Castle with a great group of people and the patron circle donors are people that support us with gifts of a thousand dollars or more throughout the year because we rely heavily on private donations as to help fund our programming uh, so then when everything kind of changed this spring we decided well we want to continue with this event uh, we had lined up a fantastic speaker that i'll announce in a minute uh, but we just wanted to open it up to everybody because we miss we miss you all we miss seeing everybody in person um, so whether you're in Nebraska or elsewhere, if you're a humanities lover, we're happy to have you with us uh, this evening. And uh, just and whether or not you're in the patron circle, we appreciate support of all sizes, all all gifts. Uh, we just appreciate um, what you do for the community. We know there's a lot of needs out there, uh, so uh, we are very appreciative. Uh, so and you know, mentioning the board of Humanities Nebraska. Uh, who are a gr great group of volunteers from all over the state and uh, who put a lot of time and energy into helping guide Humanities Nebraska. I wanna in particular single out our leadership, um, our Humanities, our council chair, Amy Sandine from Hastings and our foundation president, Nick Baxter from Omaha. And normally Nick and Amy would have been sharing some of these comments, but with doing this uh, on, um, online, we thought it'd be easier to streamline things. Uh, I also want to thank the Humanities Nebraska staff and acknowledge the real hard work of this staff. They've been magnificent as we've really transformed into working remotely and staying in touch with our partners all over the state. Uh, tonight's event was uh, largely helped. Um, the coordination for it was uh, Heather Thomas, our director of development, and Christy Hayek, our program manager, is helping with the technical support, and Sherilyn Hansen, our communication manager. But really, the entire staff is just working really hard for you all to try to continue to bring the humanities to all Nebraskans. Um, so, okay, in a, in a minute here, we'll start the program, and I want to give you a little bit of instruction here. And one is we want to keep this interactive. So, I am hoping to see some questions come through on Facebook and I will be jotting them down. And at the end, I want to, uh, after our speaker gives uh, uh, some of her remarks, we will have some Q&A with you, the audience, and, and that will go through me. So I will be watching Facebook for those comments. Um, and when you do that, we, since this is Humanities at Home, why don't you share where your home is? So I'm sitting in my home in Lincoln, Nebraska, and uh, you know, it's I like I like being home now and then, but you know, I'm ready to get out. <laughs> so I'm sure you all are too. But it's really good to be with you. Uh, so now I would like to introduce our speaker for this evening, um, Dr. Diane Bystrom. So as you may know, uh, it's the hundredth anniversary this year of the Nineteenth Amendment, and we wanted uh, to have a special program around that. So Dr. Diane Bystrom 
is the Director Emerita of the Carrie Chapman Katz Center for Women in Politics at Iowa State University. She directed that center for 22 years before retiring in 2018. She also founded Iowa State's Leadership Studies Program and served as its director for 10 years. At Iowa State, she taught courses on women in politics, political campaigns, and women in leadership. Uh, Dr. Bystrom has contributed 25 books and has written articles on women in politics, youth voters, and the Iowa caucus. Dr. Bystrom earned a bachelor's degree in journalism from Kearney, Nebraska State College, uh, now Kearney State Co uh, University of Nebraska Kearney, and a master's degree in journalism and PhD and a PhD in communications, both from the University of Oklahoma. Uh, Diane, in this past year, joined Humanities Nebraska's Speakers Bureau. And like Andy Jewell last week, uh, we have wonderful scholars uh, from around the state that are in our Speakers Bureau and are normally giving programs in libraries and schools and museums and churches and civic groups and so forth. And, uh, and, and we really appreciate that. And, and hopefully soon those speakers will be out giving programs again. Um, so she speaks to a variety of community groups about political and women's issues. And she has put together a special program for us tonight on women's suffrage in Nebraska. And before I turn it over to Diane, I'm just gonna add that after her program, we're gonna be drawing uh, a name from the attendees on this from on Facebook and uh, giving out a book uh, at the end of the evening. And I'll be announcing our governor's lecture speaker and the book that's related to that. So uh, I believe that is it. And Diane, I am gonna turn it over to you. So ladies and gentlemen, Diane Bystrom. Okay. Hi. Well, here I am in my home in Plattsmouth, Nebraska on Beaver Lake. Uh, behind me, I have some of the banners that we developed with the League of Women Voters this year, but they're at my house because we're home. And so uh, what I'm going to be talking about tonight is an abbreviated presentation that I developed on the women's suffrage movement focusing on Nebraska, but within a framework of the national movement. And I'm going to share a PowerPoint, which I'm going to do now. Let's see. Share screen. So bear with me a little bit here. Share. And share slides. Slide show. Okay. So there should be the technical things. And I'm going to appear in a little box. And I can see Chris now, but I don't know if he can see me. But anyway, I'll be talking about the long road to women's suffrage in Nebraska, which, as Chris said, culminated with the uh, ratification of the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, giving women the right to vote. And this is the 100th anniversary of that um, amendment. So before we uh, kind of talk about the, the bits and pieces about the suffrage movement, both nationally and especially in Nebraska, there are, I think, some things that are really important to remember. And one is, is that the women's suffrage campaign in the United States was very long. 72 years, in fact, and it was actually 64 years in the state of Nebraska, and Nebraskans had the opportunity to be the first territory or state that would have women's suffrage, but it failed on those attempts, and there was actually three amendments that went to the voters of the state, the male voters of the state, and they were all turned down. The suffrage uh, movement also included three generations. The first generation came out of the abolition movement and it included such famous suffragists as Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lucrece Mott, uh, Susan B. Anthony, and Frederick Douglass. Those suffrage leaders were not alive when the suffrage amendment finally passed in 1920. The middle group of suffragists uh, is where Carrie Chapman Catt fits in. Uh, as Chris said, I directed the Carrie Chapman Cat Center for Women in Politics at Iowa State for 22 years. Uh, Carrie was an Iowa State grad, and so very proud of, of, of her work in the state of Iowa. But she served as president twice of the National American Women Suffrage Association, including that key time from 1915 to 1920 with the final campaign. Then the last generation of suffragists were the younger, more militant women. Carrie Chapman Cat was considered more moderate. She worked with both political parties. The more militant women were fairly anti-Democrat because it was the Democrats that opposed suffrage at that time. So they protested at the White House. Uh, Alice Paul, again, probably the most famous one, but there is also a, a woman from Omaha, born and raised in Omaha, Dora Stevens, who was also part of those silent sentinels that, uh, that protested at the White House and were jailed. 
Um, suffrage also was not just the national campaigns. There were state campaigns in almost every state, including Nebraska. There were suffrage associations that later became leagues of women voters. And there's also a lot of local campaigns. Of course, over these 72 years, tens of thousands of volunteers were involved with the movement, not only women for many walks of life, but of course, men were involved as well because to gain suffrage, the men of the state had to approve it or the legislature or ultimately Congress. And there were also a lot of anti-suffrage organizations, including in Nebraska, and typically these were led by women. Uh, and by the end of the campaign, millions of dollars was spent on women gaining the right to vote. So historians agree that the women's suffrage movement started in Seneca Falls, New York. Um, they had a women's rights convention there. It was organized by Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Uh, 200 people attended. It was uh, women only the first day and then men were allowed the second day. About 200 women uh, participated and 40 men, including Frederick Douglass, the renowned uh, abolitionist and former slave. Um, they passed uh, 11 resolutions. And what they, and I'm gonna move this, I think they passed 11 resolutions and the most controversial resolution turned out to be achieving women's sacred right to elective franchise. They thought that was way too radical. And so it was actually Frederick Douglass that um, gave a very passionate speech saying that you need to approve this as one of your resolutions and it was. The suffrage movement in Nebraska really dates back to 1855, just you know, seven years after the national movement began. Amelia Bloomer came to Omaha to speak in 1855. She was an Iowa suffrage leader living in Council Bluffs, came over the river, talked in Omaha in front of Douglas House, and her speech was so inspirational that people that heard it suggested to the territorial legislature that they should invite her to speak. So they did just that. She spoke on January 8th of 1856, and on January 25th, the House in the, in the territorial legislature passed a women's suffrage uh, resolution, but the session ended without a vote in the upper house. In 1867, Nebraska actually became the second state in the nation following Kansas to uh, approve what we call a school suffrage. And that was to allow uh, inhabitants 21 years of age and older to vote in school district elections. Uh, it took effect in 1869 but then it was amended in 1875 just to include male citizens and unmarried women, which seems a little counterintuitive that married women with children would not be voting on school uh, issues, but it was extended again in 1881 to women with school-aged children. So the very first vote to the voters, three, I said told you earlier, Nebraska male voters had three chances to approve women's suffrage uh, in Nebraska. The first one came in 1871 when delegates gathered uh, to write a constitution for the new state. They wrote a constitution that included a proposal for women's suffrage as an amendment. The whole constitution was turned down by voters, but the amendment that got the least support, only 22% of the vote was a women's suffrage proposal. So here the delegates convened again four years later to write another state constitution. And this time they thought we're not gonna include women's suffrage in this constitution. Not only are we not gonna include it, we're going to deny voting rights to criminals, the mentally ill, and to women. And that was approved by the male voters of the state. So around that time, uh, national suffrage leaders st still saw Nebraska as an opportunity to become the first state in the nation that would grant women's suffrage. Now I should mention in 1869, the women's suffrage movement uh, split into two organizations, the American Women's Suffrage Association and the National Women's Suffrage Association over disagreements over support for the 14th and especially 15th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, giving voting rights to African American men, but not to women. So Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton were in the National Women's Suffrage Association, uh, and although they were focusing on a federal constitutional amendment, they did some state suffrage work, and they did come to Nebraska in 1877. Uh, Susan B. Anthony spoke, speaks in Hebron and Beatrice, and then in 1879, Elizabeth Cady Stanton visits Hebron, and she also helped organize the Thayer County Women's Suffrage Association, the first local suffrage association in the state. Two other prominent suffrage uh, leaders in Nebraska were Erasmus and Lucy Correll. They were the editors of the pro-suffrage Hebron Journal. And in 1880, Erasmus was elected to the a legislature. So he had a resolution uh, that basically removed mail from the state constitution and the legislature passed the resolution to send that to the voters. So that same year, the Nebraska Women's Suffrage Association was founded to help promote that resolution with voters of the state and the vote was to come up in 1882. So that's when there was a very intense campaign for women's suffrage in Nebraska. 
uh, the National Women's uh, Suffrage Association, the American Women's Suffrage Association held their national conventions in Omaha. But in that fall, Nebraska male voters rejected for the second time uh, the suffrage amendment. Another suffrage leader in Nebraska is Clara B. Col Colby of Beatrice. She began publishing the Women's Journal in 1883. Now this was actually a national journal and uh, it was published for 26 years, uh, later headquartered in Washington, DC. Uh, Clara also served as president of the Nebraska Women's Suffrage Association in 1885 and eight to 1898. Now, as Chris said earlier, we were going to be at Jocelyn Castle tonight and uh, did some reading on Sarah Jocelyn uh, and found out that she was also involved in the suffrage movement. Uh, she basically, she was a great uh, philanthropist, she and her husband, and she gave to a lot of uh, community causes, but she supported with their money pro-suffrage candidates uh, for political office. And in 1888, she attended a uh, convention of the Nebraska Women's Suffrage Association and was appointed to a state suffrage committee on resolutions. Another suffrage leader around this time, and she worked not only on suffrage, but on other, um, other community activities in Omaha was Jessie Hill Moss. She was a, a social worker who helped establish the Negro Women's Christian Association in Omaha. That organization focused a lot on social activities and educational events and community building for African-American neighborhoods in Omaha, but they also supported women's voting rights and campaign for that within the African-American community. So back on the national level, the US Women's Suffrage Campaign basically merged and came together in 1890. They were not very successful working on their own from 1869 to 1890. No state or territory approved women's suffrage in that time. So they joined together and became the National American Women's Suffrage Association. And they decided first that they would focus on state suffrage. And they got their first win in 1890 when Wyoming was admitted to the union with a state constitution granting women's suffrage. And that was closely followed by other Western states, Colorado in 1893, Utah and Idaho in 1896, and then in 1910, Washington State granted women's suffrage. In 1915, Carrie Chapman Catt was elected to her second term as president of the National American Women's Suffrage Association. And she gave a speech in 1916 where she revealed her winning plan focusing on a federal constitutional amendment, which was financed by a bequest that she got in a will of a prominent uh, woman New York City publisher that today would be valued at $25 million. 1917, Doris Stevens, who I mentioned earlier, she was born in Omaha, grew up in Omaha, later went to college in Ohio and settled to New York City. She was jailed in 1917, along with Alice Paul and other silent sent sentinels for their protests at the White House. Doris later wrote a book called Jailed uh, for Freedom, and which was published in 1920. Okay. Back in Nebraska, we have our third attempt to have a women's suffrage amendment in the state. And they actually had a campaign that was called Nebraska Next because it wasn't first, but, but Nebraska might be next. In 1914, a suffrage resolution barely was defeated in the legislature. So the women's suffrage associations got together, collected, I think it was about 48,000 signatures to place a petition on the ballot in 1914. And it was very narrowly defeated that year by about a 51 to 49% percent um, uh, margin. So certainly support for suffrage was a growing tide in Nebraska. In 1917, a limited suffrage bill passed the legislature with the support of pro-suffrage Governor Keith Neville. And that resolution gave women the right to vote in city elections and for presidential electors. Uh, there were anti-suffrage efforts to put the referendum on the ballot for the 1918 election, but suffrage leaders found out that many of the signatures were fraudulent, and so that was thrown out. It eventually went to the Nebraska Supreme Court. They supported the suffrage uh, advocates against the anti-suffrage forces, and Nebraska women could vote in 1919 not only in school district elections, but in local elections. And that first election was held in Geneva, and more women than men cast their votes approving a sewage bond. Now, a, per, a point of a personal history is that uh, Morel Keith Neville, uh, the pro-suffrage governor, is the grandfather of my husband, Keith Neville Bystrom. Okay, so now on the national level, the tide is turning nationally as well. Uh, Susan B. Anthony Amendment, as it was known, had been introduced in the U.S. Congress for 42 years with exactly the same language that it was approved in 1920. Um, it actually, uh, some years it never got out of committee, some years it would get out of committee. In 1918, the House voted to approve it, but it failed in the Senate. Uh, Woodrow Wilson supported the amendment by 
18, but in 1990, the House approved the amendment in May, on May 21st and the uh, Senate quickly confirmed on June 4th. So then it goes to the state. So the ratification process is that three fourths of the state need to approve an amendment before it's added to the constitution. There were 48 states in 1920, so that meant there had to be 36 states that voted. You can see by here, and I go through all of this, but that ratification process started on June 10th, and you have a lot of states jumping on board in those early months. Nebraska was the 14th state to ratify the 19th Amendment on August 2nd, 1919. So you get down to March, and you have West Virginia and Washington, and then you're stuck with 35 states, and who's going to be the 36th state? There were some legislatures that weren't even convened in 1920 and others that said, we're not gonna take this up. But Tennessee was a state that agreed to take it up. It was a state that's a Southern state, but there was an active pro-suffrage campaign, but also a very active anti-suffrage campaign. But that looked like the best bet. So the suffrage leaders, Carrie Chapman can't move down there to a hotel. Uh, efforts were there all summer. And there's lots of interesting stories out of Tennessee, but one of my favorites involves Harry T. Byrne. He was 24 years old, the youngest member of the Congress, he was, or the legislature, he was in the House of Representatives from Eastern Tennessee. He had planned to vote against the amendment because he was told by his party that that's what his constituents would want. But on the day of the vote where suffrage leaders thought this is going to fail by one vote, um, Harry had a telegram from his mother. And that telegram read in part, Harry, be a good boy, help Mrs. Cat put the rat in ratification and the amendment passed by one vote. And I think also that underscores the importance of voting and that one vote does matter. So women's voting rights became uh, the women's, uh, the suffrage amendment was ratified on August 26, 1920. That's still uh, it's celebrated today as Women's Equality Day. That celebration is taking place every year since the 1970s. There were great celebrations across the United States. Carrie Chapman Catt, who's pictured here on the cover of Time Magazine, gave a speech in New York City. And it's a very eloquent speech and in part reads about the vote being the emblem of these women's equality, the guarantee of their liberty. She talked about all the agony that women suffrage leaders had suffered over the years so that not only the woman there could vote, but their daughters were going to be able to vote as well. Uh, the vote has been costly and prize it. And the speech ends, ends with progress is calling on you to make no pause act. Carrie Chapman Catt devoted 33 years of her life to the suffrage movement. Uh, she founded the League of Women Voters on February 14, 1920 before the uh, amendment was ratified because she knew that, um, that this was not the end of the campaign, that women needed to be educated and encouraged to vote. Uh, the 19th Amendment enfranchised 27 million women uh, three months before the presidential election. According to a New York Times article, they said 10 million women voted. Uh, so that would be about uh, one third of the women voters. So there was some disappointment there, but Carrie Chapman Catt reminded them that they were new voters and that work would continue. From 1924 to 1965, there were court decisions, congressional actions, and, um, uh, and other efforts to extend the right to vote to men and women of color. And so by 1964, um, more women than men have voted in every general election, uh, both in terms of numbers and also in terms of percentages. In, in 2016, for example, 74 million women voted compared to 64 million men, a difference of 10 million. So that difference was 10 million in 19, uh, 2016 when only 10 million women voted in 1920. That's the end of my presentation. Uh, and I'm now uh, happy to take your questions. Thank you, Diane. That's wonderful. And we do have some questions coming in. And I, and I was also jotting my own notes and questions, and I could probably monopolize the whole thing. But I am going to go first uh, to the first question that came in, which was actually Ellen Lyric in Alliance. And Ellen asked, what was the rationale for opposition to women's suffrage? So I guess just bigger picture, the opposition to women's suffrage? Well, over the 70s, there, so basically the suffrage movement actually went from different strategies. At the beginning, it was sort of like, we, we're equal citizens and we want equality. By the end, they started, uh, they started arguing with the progressive movement that women were going to clean up politics. And so what they did sort of that middle of the movement and Carrie Chapman Catt was part of it is that she 
got other organizations to join the suffrage movement because, for example, if you want to uh, change child labor laws, then you need the vote. If you want to do this, you need the vote. But one of the organizations that they worked very closely with was the Women's Christian Temperance Union. So they worked very closely with the group that wanted to outlaw alcohol, it was pro-prohibition. So some of the anti-forces were, of course, then tied with the alcohol and brewing industry. And that was true in Nebraska as well. Um, they, the women thought that, uh, you know, and they would argue that, you know, politics was a dirty thing, that, that uh, women didn't want to be involved. They, uh, in Nebraska, the anti-suffrage organization argued that women would have to sit on juries and hear all sorts of grisly details of crime. And so um, those were basically it. But I, I, a prohibition, I think, was really a big part of it because there was uh, the men that were voting in there did not, they, they saw the suffrage movement as being aligned with the, the prohibition movement. Great. I'm going to sneak in one of my own questions and follow up into that, actually. And then we have we do have a couple more. But I was thinking about when you were talking about the 18, I think it was the 1890s when Susan B. Anthony and, and Elizabeth mm -hmm. Cady Stanton were visiting mm -hmm. Nebraska. What mm -hmm. kind of reception did they have back then when they were coming to Nebraska? Did it well, cause it a big stir? Yeah, they, they came here first in 1877 at the uh, invitation of the Corrells from Hebron. And so they were very pro-suffrage. They had a pro-suffrage newspaper. And so he, Erasmus uh, and Lucy, uh, invited Susan B. Anthony to come, and she did. And I thought the thing that's interesting I need to dig into more is like you can see from uh, the notes is that the suffrage movement in Nebraska in the early days was very much headquartered in Hebron, which makes some sense because they had the paper there that was pro-suffrage, but also in Beatrice. And so that was kind of interesting to me. So it wasn't really, the, you know, I, there were women in Omaha involved, but, uh, you know, another uh, suffrage leader who became, uh, later became president of the League of Women Voters, she was also president of the, um, of the, um, uh, Nebraska Women's Suffrage Association held from Hastings. And so there were a lot of, you know, suffrage leaders that were in these sort of mid Southern uh, Nebraska communities. Okay. And I know we have some Hastings people like Amy Sandine mm -hmm. listening in, yeah. so probably appreciated that. Yeah. And you just, I think you just partially answered a question we got from Gloria Betcher, actually, who was uh, watching He's from, from Ames, Ames, Iowa. Ames yeah. Yeah. Friend, hi, Gloria. <laughs> friend from Ames, Iowa. Hi, Gloria. There you go. And she was wondering about where, whether Heben and Beatrice were um, early sites for suffrage meetings because the newspapers were supportive. So you you kind of said, yes, that's affirmative. You were, I think you said that was the case. And she just wondered, you know, if those communities weren't necessarily progressive hotbeds. I guess I wonder about that tension, like were newspapers sometimes a bit ahead of their time and being supportive of women's suffrage a little I bit ahead so. of their people. The other thing about uh, both um, the, the Corrells as well as um, uh, uh, about uh, Colby is that they actually moved here from other states and they were educated women that had attended universities, uh, I think, uh, uh, one was from, I, and Erasmus Corell was from Canada. And so, you know, and they became a citizen here. So they, they weren't native Nebraskans necessarily that were behind this movement. They were, they were men and women that moved to the state from other states. And, you know, around that time too, um, it was sort of the dawn of the progressive movement and the progressive movement was fairly strong in Nebraska back in those days. And so, um, they so the suffrage movement really grew and intensified in 1890 and beyond because of women being interested in lots of different organizations and being involved in lots of civic organizations and that spilled over into being involved in the suffrage movement. Terrific. Uh, I don't know. We might have a freeze on the Facebook feed, so I'm not sure if people can have uh, hear my audio or not. But I'm going to go ahead and ask this next question from Chris Hochstetler, a good friend of the humanities in um, Grand Island. He's the executive director of the Stewart Museum of the Prairie Pioneer out there. And he said, it seems that the that misogyny is at the root of why suffrage took too long or took so long and still seems present today. Why do you think so many women aligned themselves against suffrage, what was their argument? Well, their argument was, is that um, they wanted to preserve, they, they were, they were, uh, 
they were nervous about their place in the home. And so they wanted to preserve what they felt was their place in the home, encouraged by their husbands. Um, they felt like they were going to be forced to do things that they didn't want to do if they were voters. It's kind of interesting. I, I don't know if any of the, your viewers are, but I started watching Mrs. America on Wednesday night. That's the documentary about uh, the Equal Rights Amendment and Phyllis Schafly. And so, you know, some of those, uh, so I was reminded that some of those same arguments that were on the Equal Rights Amendment uh, in, in the 1990s were, or the 19, gosh, 80, 1980s, were the, some of the same ones is that it just basically a debate over what women's appropriate role should be in society. And so uh, another, another very active force against suffrage, not only in Nebraska, but nationally was um, the Catholic Church. And so that was another one. So it was really just a discussion of what appropriate roles for women should be. And, you know, through my research, you know, we, we still see that today. You know, I do research on media coverage of women political candidates. And I can tell you to this day is that they're, the women get, especially when they run for president, get a very gendered um, uh, portrayal in the media. And it's really related to what's an appropriate role for women in our society. Right, right, thank you. Um, I have a question from June Peterson, a friend of ours, of the friend of the humanities here in Lincoln. And she asked if the women's suffrage effort in England provided strategies for uh, the United States. It did for that last group, Alice Paul. So Alice Paul and Lucy Burns, they were, they actually were, uh, as part of their education, they were in Great Britain and they joined the suffrage movement in Great Britain. And the suffrage movement in Great Britain used very militant uh, tactics they had um, you know, they had protests, they had parades, they threw rocks, they did all sorts of things. And so when Alice Paul and Lucy Burns came back to the United States, they did at first join the National American Women's Suffrage Association, which Kat was president of. And they first were in a group called the Congressional Committee. And then they formed the Congressional Union. And then they, you know, they were getting increasingly more militant. And actually, in some ways, Kat used that to her advantage by saying to Woodrow Wilson, who do you want to work with? You want to work with this group that's protesting you at the White House or do you want to work with me? And he eventually said, oh, I'll work with you. And so, but like any social movement, it, it, it gets accomplished on all sides. And so you have this more militant force that is doing things that actually then helps the more moderate efforts. And so, yes, there was the, the militant. And, and another thing notable about Alice Paul is that they later went on to form the National Women's Party, which still exists today, but they also started working on the Equal Rights Amendment. So they did work on um, something after the suffrage movement ended. Uh, it, well, you know, that actually connects to another question we just got from uh, Carol Remp, a former board member of Humanities in Nebraska, who now lives across the border in South Dakota, but still mm -hmm. uh, still paying attention here in Nebraska. Hi, Carol. Um, and she wondered how the early suffrage movement is, is different from the feminist movement today. And um, so I guess uh, just what are your thoughts on how, um, you know, how the movement today uh, towards uh, gender equality uh, relates to the suffrage movement early on? Well, I would say, um, you know, there's been a lot of uh, historians will call uh, the suffrage movement the, the first wave of feminism, and we've already gone through a second wave, which a lot of us knew from the 1970s, and then a third wave of feminism. I think all along with those waves, it's become more inclusive of women in color uh, along the way. I think that has changed it. Um, I think the, the campaign for the Equal Rights Amendment uh, was... Um, similar in some ways to the campaign for women's suffrage, but uh, you know, expanding those rights out. I mean, the, the 1960s were actually a pretty fruitful time for legislation affecting women with the uh, Equal Pay Act and some of the, um, the other you know, acts that came up in that year. And so um, you know, there are some parallels, but I would say overall um, that I think there's probably more women of color and more different uh, more representation in the women's movement today than there was in the suffrage movement. Since you are a, a student of politics, you know, and that kind of connection between politics and and uh, and women's issues, like, can you, what would you venture to be a guess? This is a question actually, um, I believe from Andrea Miller, who's out in, in Bayard area, um, to state politics today, if women hadn't had the, the right to vote. So how has state politics changed? How, how did state politics change once women had the right to vote? 
Well, at first it didn't hardly change at all. In fact, what you saw is that you saw that you know, women allegedly voted the way their husbands told them to vote. And so, so overall, uh, it didn't change at the beginning. What has happened over time, uh, in the 1920 election, women supported the Republican candidate that year. Over time, they've been increasingly more uh, supportive of Democratic ca candidates, uh, certainly on the national level. Uh, there's something that we call the gender gap. It's been in place ever since uh, 1980. And that is basically the difference between men and women voting for one candidate. And so there's been uh, double digit gender gaps in several different elections, uh, including the most recent 2016 election. And so, um, so women do vote differently. You know, there has been an overall increase in representation of women at all levels of office, including in Nebraska. Um, that the you know, Nebraska though is below the national average, uh, but you know one of the things that we are trying to do uh, with um, with other organizations. I was more active in this in Iowa is that you know campaign schools for women. I ran a program called Ready to Run uh, Iowa. I'd love to find a, a sponsor for Ready to Run Nebraska, but it's a nonpartisan training school, and so we really focused on recruiting women to run for local, state, and some federal offices, and had some success in Iowa. Uh, we went from um, less than 25% of women in the state legislature to 33% in the year the year I left. And I can tell you at my retirement party, they put up those statistics and told me I had a lot of work to do in Nebraska. <laughs> wow, okay. Yeah. Um, well, and that kind of connects, Sir Crook down in uh, Peru area um, is also a former board member and, and a, a great humanities person. Um, she commented that the US still has a low gender development index, GDI, um, and compared to other democracies and wondered about why the U.S. lags in that area, including women in politics, and just wonders what Nebraska could do to encourage more women to seek political impact. So, um, I mean, you addressed a little bit of that just a minute ago, yeah. but any other comments on that? Yeah, and there's other organizations in the state that uh, work to um, to get more in, women interested in politics. Um, and actually the League of Women Voters of Greater Omaha has a program every year for high school students. And I think that's a really smart thing to do because one of the things that we know from research is that women have much less political ambition than men. And so when, uh, when uh, boys and girls are in high school, they both have little political ambition and that's a, a commitment or a desire to run for political office in the future. So that gap is really small in high school and it grows by 10 to 11 percentage points in college. And then by the time men and women graduate from college and enter the, the workforce, that percentage can be as high as 16%. And these, are, and these studies basically survey equally qualified uh, people at a point in their career, typically from law, business, education, and the state legislature. So they ask these equally qualified men and women, have they ever thought of running for office? And women are 16 points less likely to say that. And part of the reason is, um, one of the reasons is is a balance between family and, and work that still is you know a burden you know falls more heavily on women, and then others is just you know you see these anecdotal stories where uh, women will go to city council meetings for like four years they'll study all the issues and then you say why don't you run for office and they'll say I don't know if I know enough about it where a man will look in the mirror in the morning and say I think I'll run for governor and so you know so men just have a lot more I guess confidence in running for office you know women do face. Um, like I said, there's some bias, some media bias, and those, those are very real things they face. They don't think they can raise money, but they can. And so that's what these campaign schools seek to address. Yeah. Well, and we are getting a lot of questions and comments, <laughs> Diane. This is great. We could go all night, but I know that uh, we promised to keep this fairly fairly brief so we didn't uh, get too much into people's dinner hour. But I think following up on what you just said with a, a great maybe closing question comes from Jennifer uh, Dre Beldis in Omaha, and she's just wondering now that we're at that hundred year point of uh, the vote, you know, where do you see women and uh, voting and advocacy going next? What, what do you what do you see is coming, you know, in the future? Well, I'm going to start out by saying that Jen is one of my former students at Iowa State University, and she worked uh, with me at the Cat Center. So Jen, I'm glad you're tuning in. You've been a great advocate to, uh, for women throughout your career as well. Um, what I see uh, is hopefully, uh, I'm working on a book now on women in politics with a colleague of mine at the University of Kansas. And we actually had completed most of that book because we had an August, uh, an April 15th deadline, but now it's been extended by the publisher so we can include 
the COVID-19 pandemic and how it affects voters. But I think what we see, and, I, and I've already finished the chapter on, um, uh, on the vote and gender, gender and the vote. And one of the things you saw, certainly I think in 2018, is this huge turnout of women voters. And what you're seeing overall are women voters um, that, um, especially suburban women, uh, turning uh, toward, in this case, the Democratic Party. And so I think one of the things, it'll be interesting to see the 2020 election from all sorts of reasons. I mean, you know, uh, will it be, you know, vote by mail? I mean, yeah, yeah, is it, there's all kinds of things that are going to be happening, I think, with the 2020 election. But certainly, I think there's been a surge in women's activism uh, since the 2016 election. You know, that year, you know, there were a lot of people who thought that, you know, women wouldn't be inspired to run the next election year, primarily because what they saw the, the treatment of Hillary Clinton by the national media. And so um, instead of that, uh, I remember the day after the election, I went into the office and I had been at the local NBC affiliate till after 11, came home. Uh, and, you know, I thought that was going to be the year that we were going to elect the first woman president. And, you know, so I came home and, and I was registered as an independent in Nebraska the whole time I was there, but I was very much hoping to, to, um, to elect a woman president. And I thought, boy, you know, we're having our campaign school, you know, we're going to, we were going to announce it the week after the election. I thought no one's going to want to come. And we started getting emails. We had uh, more than 90 emails between the day after the election and Sunday wanting to know when our next campaign school was because we hadn't announced it yet. And so we had 172 participants in our, 20, uh, our 2017 ready to run, which was more, it was, you know, quadrupled previous attendance. And so campaign schools for women have uh, started up after that time. You have women, uh, there's now the Nevada legislature that is a majority woman legislature. And so there's been a lot of gains from 2016 to the present at the state level and at the local level as well. When we ran ready to run in 2017, uh, a number of those women went, ran for school board and a number of school boards, including the ones in Ames, went from majority male school boards to majority female. And so I think there have been a lot of gains across the nation with women getting elected. We have the most women now in the US Congress than we've ever had. It's still not enough, but we have not only more women in the US Congress, but it's a more diverse group of women, younger women, women with military backgrounds, women of color. And so I think in some ways, the result of the 2016 election has spurred um, uh, interest in women's uh, and what they bring. And, and you know, kind of answering a question earlier is that one of the reasons that you know women, I think, are so good in political office is that they, they studies have shown they're much more collaborative than men and they're much more willing to work across the aisle in a bipartisan way. And I think we can all agree that that's something we could use. <laughs> Absolutely, I second that wholeheartedly. And I think that was a great high note to um, kind of finish up on. I got a couple questions for you. One is just because of your position at the Carrie Chapman Cat Center, uh, we had somebody ask, uh, actually Susan Reynolds, if you ha could give any good biographical resource for information on Carrie Chapman Cat. Well, gosh, I think the best biography of her is by Jacqueline Van Voris, and it was actually published quite a while ago, I think in the mid, um, uh, probably the mid 80s. That's the book I read before I accepted the position at the Cat Center. So okay. Robert Fowler has a biography. It's pretty good. But Jacqueline Van Voris, I think that was is a very well uh, researched one. I can't think of the title now. I think it's Carrie Chapman Cat, Feminist Politician. Uh, so I think that's a good research on Carrie Chapman Cat. Actually, the New Woman's Hour, which was published in 2018 by Elaine Weiss, she's a former journalist, and it's more of a read about what happened in Tennessee. So it's a really kind of lively read, and it's a pretty good research on resource on Carrie Chapman Cat as well. And so I would say those two books are are good. But the Van Voris book comes back time and time again. In fact, I was just uh, helping the director of the current director of the Cat Center with an article she was writing and she was looking for a quote. She knew the quote, but she couldn't remember where it was. It was from Jacqueline Voris, uh, Van Voris's book. And so I think that's a good book about Cat. Well, Diane, I think there could be another a book project in your future here too. <laughs> uh, you would certainly be qualified for that. And that's just, um, you know, but we really appreciate your time. And I guess I, I don't want to push it too much, but I think people would probably love to have you back. So we might want to talk about doing this again. I don't mind answering any more questions. I eat a late dinner, but I'm happy to stay up. <laughs> well, why don't, or people can get this. 
we will uh, we'll see if we can organize a part two of this sometime uh, in the coming months. And also uh, we'll look at all the questions we got um, on the comments and maybe we can follow up with something where we write up some of the, the questions for you and get some responses. But I think it'd be wonderful to have you back sometime and we really appreciate you uh, spending the time with us and all the great work you do. Um, and by the way, your friend, Jennifer uh, Drebelbis, but I know um, by just coincidence, I guess, happens to be the winner of our book this evening, oh, which, uh, yes, so uh, Jen, um, you have won a copy of uh, Doris, Kern Good Doris Kearns Goodwin's book, Leadership in Turbulent Times, because Doris Kearns Goodwin is going to be the 2020 Governor's Lecture in the Humanities Speaker uh, here in Nebraska on September 22nd in Lincoln at the Lead Center. Uh, you know, Lord willing that we are all getting back together in person. If not, we're going to get creative and find a way for everybody to still enjoy the governor's lecture with Doris Kearns Goodwin. It's a fabulous book. And so, Jen, why don't you mess? We'll make sure we, we know how to reach you, but we'll message you and see if we can uh, make sure we have your contact information. Um, I hope I know everybody joins me in thanking you again, Diane, for your time on this. And and since we have, you know, we'll we'll definitely talk some more and, and get you in front of people again and definitely in person again. I know we're all waiting for that to happen. Um, and I just want to kind of finish up by just thanking everybody again. All, um, we have our board of directors meeting tomorrow. Uh, a group of wonderful people there. All the people that are listening and watching that are supporting Humanities Nebraska. Um, we are just greatly appreciative of all of you. And as, as I said at the beginning, we really want to see everybody in person again and come back together and, 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 and be together exploring what it means to be human and to uh, you know, uh, use the humanities in all the shapes and forms that make society what it is and makes life worth living. And, and we will all be together again soon. So um, we really thank you for your time. And um, just follow us on social media, if you uh, can not only Facebook, but Twitter or Instagram, and uh, sign up for our weekly e-blast, uh, which is now our Humanities at Home e-blast, uh, where we're sharing a lot of resources. And you can um, uh, just go online and find us at humanitiesnebraska.org and figure out uh, how to sign up for our newsletter there. There's also a way to, ways to give section if you wanna support, uh, choose to support us. And otherwise we just look forward to staying in touch in the weeks and months ahead as we kind of figure out what the new normal is. Humanities Nebraska is gonna be involved in distributing grants around the state um, as part of the uh, CARES Act that Congress passed. Um, there is some money, um, to the National Endowment of the Arts and the National Endowment of the Humanities. So we are working closely with the Nebraska Arts Council uh, to um, come up with uh, plans for helping uh, uh, organizations all across the state who are financially struggling right now. So uh, pay attention uh, for more information on that. And we just look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you all. And uh, hopefully we'll see you at another Humanities at Home soon.